conceptual Jay sounded better than Jay Prince. People talk Real about talk, it. I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. I hope everybody has had a, an awesome week. I hope that you have accomplished many of the things that you set out. Uh, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, if you're still breathing, you're still in the fight, there is still work to be done. Uh, you have not yet finished the course. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and press towards the mark. Uh, I am here uh, for our next installment of Beyond the Surface. I told you guys that I was going to be doing this on Thursdays. I'm going to be a little late getting it up. Uh, There's a lot going on um, on the business side of things and in the Wallace household kind of got me a little behind schedule, but I definitely wanted to get that to you, get this to you uh, this week. And so I'm going to be kicking off a series on the battle for the mind of African Americans, but also the power of the mind to overcome all of the different issues, elements, concerns, and illnesses, and everything else that we face. I'm going to merge the work that I've done in the black community along with the work that I've done in the worlds of psychology and neuroscience uh, to bring this all together to help you understand why it's so important to guard your gates, monitor the things that you allow to infiltrate your gates, your eyes, your ears, what you hear and what you see is so powerful in uh, manufacturing and managing who you are, how you operate, how you respond to things. And I'm going to talk to you about that. I'm going to give you an overview of this series, which is going to roughly be about 11 weeks or so. Uh, but I'm going to give you enough today that will really truly open your eyes to how this thing works and why we've been so impacted about it and why it has not just impacted us uh, collectively, uh, collectively, but also individually. I want to uh, encourage you to continue to support what we do at the uh, Odyssey Project and the Visionetics Institute uh, because it all works towards helping to come up with solutions that help empower our people, help promote our people, and help put us in a place to where we can rise up and be what we were designed to be living life at the level of our design as individuals and as a collective and so what i want to talk to you about is the force of propaganda by way of media and its impact on the mind and the brain and the overall health of anyone that it, 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 it uh, finds an audience with uh, while this can be true for any race and any person no one is exempt from the power of influence by way of information and mental and emotional stimuli i want to specifically focus on how it applies to us uh blacks as a race and i want to also talk about it on a level that says okay this is what's happening and we can look at this but also this is what we have the capacity to do as a people but also as individuals in improving our lives you've heard me say on more than one occasion uh, that uh, propaganda has been used um, for years to control the thinking to control the behavior to control the expectations all I mean even control how we as a people perceive ourselves how we see ourselves what we aspire to uh, what we give into what we sit up and base the, the, the total core of our beliefs on is highly influenced by media propaganda in so many different ways that we won't even touch on that today but I want to talk about how this thing works I want to talk to you on how I've engaged it as a researcher how I've engaged it as a psychologist how I've engaged it as a black thinker and how I've used it to empower my my, 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 my children uh, improve my marriage 
give me a solid foundation and a very turbulent time business and bit for business wise and finance uh, to be able to survive some very trying times uh, with this COVID pandemic thing. I want to really talk about this. So I'm going to be talking about the power of media to influence. But what I'm going to do is go beyond what is normally shared. You know, you can go, you can read books like Propaganda by Edward Bernays, published in 1933. You can read uh, Brainwashed by Tom Burrell, uh, a black man who owned one of the most successful PR uh, firms uh, in history, and see that it's obvious that media... Uh, and the information that is pushed on us by media have has the ability to impact us. But I want to talk about it on a scientific level. I want to talk about how this works. It's important to understand how it works because in understanding how it works, you also understand how to combat it. You understand how to change what's going on. And so two of the things that I came in contact with in studying our behavior uh, is uh, t first neuroplasticity and we're going to talk about this in depth in the coming weeks and epigenetics something else we're going to talk about in the coming weeks but basically what you have to understand is there's this belief uh, that once existed that by the age seven or eight you're hardwired with your personality your personality is what creates your personal reality how you think how you act and how you feel uh, is the sum total of your personality in in high simplification. It is the sum total of your personality and how you think, how you act, and how you feel is going to determine how you approach life and it's going to dictate your reality. If you believe something will have a negative impact on you, it ultimately will. If you behave based on what you think and you believe, you will actually start to perpetuate situations that create that reality positively or negatively how you think how you approach things but here's the thing that was once this idea that a person's personality was hardwired in them if you were an introvert you were going to always be an introvert if you're an extrovert you're going to always be an extrovert if you were highly volatile quick tempered if you were very docile and, and, and unengaged whatever the situation is that's who you were going to be but now we know that's not the case we know now there's this thing called neuroplasticity neuroplasticity is an understanding of how new realities, new ideas, and even new beliefs are created. Every time you engage something that you never engaged before, you create these new neurosynaptic connections. These connections are a snapshot of what you've just experienced, what you've just been exposed to. Now, depending on the frequency at which you engage this new idea, uh, will determine the length of life and the gravity and depth and the strength of this new synaptic, cre uh, this new neuron, uh, the neuro uh, connection. It's going to uh, determine it. And the more you visit it, the more um, stronger it becomes, but also it starts to connect with other neural networks based off of association. The brain has this unbelievable capacity to categorize and it does it in such rapid form. I'm talking about in a split second, it can take a new idea connected with all other associative ideas and realities and past experiences so that now it can be referred to as a part of the new paradigm based off of all of the experiences combined. What does that mean? That means that if I start to have, if I have a belief about flying, uh, one of the, the, the greatest interruptions of paradigms was flight. Uh, the, the, the first belief that man could not fly. And then all of a sudden the introduction of the first uh, flying mechanisms offered up by the Wright brothers and a new idea. Now that new idea is invented to the old idea and in that case it completely interrupts it and changes it because what was once thought impossible is now impossible. But this happens on all different types of levels, not just on uh, highly polarizing, highly dynamic ideas, but every single thing that you've ever thought can be changed or altered and adjust it based off of new experiences. That's why I am highly focused in teaching my clients the importance of learning something new every day and being intentional. I, I, I can't stress that enough that being intentional in what you engage. So you control how you grow, the direction you grow in, your mentality, the development of who you are, the development of an engaging and evolving psyche. It's, it's up to you. So 
the power of intention. Now, here's the thing. In the power of intention, this neuroplasticity says that instead of being hardwired into something, we are constantly changing based off of our experiences. This is also true with epigenetics. Epigenetics is this study of uh, how genes work to create a certain health reality uh, and experience, how we age and so many more things. What we learned and how I came across epigenetics was in the research to uh, become more aware and to uh, validate or invalidate the idea of multi-generational trauma and how multi-generational trauma is transmitted over time. And what, what, I, what I came across was epigenetics, the study of the influence of gene expression and gene regulation without the changing of gene, DNA sequence. So what we know now is DNA, like the brain, isn't so hardwired that once this is who you are, you, you can't change it. You can change your health. You can change so much about yourself by understanding and the mind, the, the, the brain, the mind, and the body and genes are all uh, interconnected and influence one another. And that's important. Uh, what I learned is that first and foremost, there are these things called epigenetic tags. Epigenetic tags are these imprints within the gen the gene makeup or the uh, that uh, represent highly traumatic experiences. Um, and so what you find out in these highly traumatic experiences is that there's these genetic tags. Well, in most cases, smaller tags are erased through the reproductive process. You know, when a woman goes through her monthly cycle, those, uh, those tags are taken away through the process when the 23 chromosomes from the female uh, merge with the 23 chromosomes of the male. There's a cleansing process that goes on through the uh, function of mitosis. Uh, excuse me, meiosis. Mitosis is regular cell reproduction. Meiosis is reproductive cell reproduction. And so what happens is as these cells uh, create themselves to be passed on, most of those tags are washed away. But what we found in studying Jews from the Holocaust is that some tags can be so emphatic that they're not cleansed in the reproductive process and they're passed on to the progeny, meaning that the offspring will have a trauma wired into them that they never actually experienced themselves. We understand it because there were actually offspring from Jews that actually were in a, a part of and experienced the Holocaust. These offspring weren't born during the Holocaust, they were born after it, but they were literally having dreams of things that happened to their parents or grandparents. They were having these dreams, and so they started to understand it and realize that it was coming from the genetic tags. But also we learn, and I'm going to be speeding through this because this isn't about one thing. This is about the overview. And then each week we're going to talk about something in specific and how we can work and understand how it's being used against us now versus how we can take control of it. And so I want to get through this. So we're talking about the power of attention now, but what happens is with epigenetics, we found in studying identical twins, meaning that they have the uh, same exact DNA, that you, you will start to learn as twins get older, they become more discernible, uh, distinct. You can begin to tell them apart, and the reason being is they're having different life experiences. Uh, and those life experiences impact their health, they impact their well-being, uh, they impact their mindset. Uh, also, uh, the neuroplasticity uh, associated with those experiences is creating different ways of thinking. That diff Those different ways of thinking are subsequently also impacting the genetic uh, expression uh, gene regulation. Um, and it's so important to understand that. that I got so excited about the epigenetic thing that I delved deeper off into it and started to understand it and I wrote a couple of papers of how epigenetics uh, play such a major role in disease. Um, and I was actually contacted by the International uh, Council for Epigenetics on Cancer and asked to speak in Frankfurt, Germany back in 2015 um, based on papers that I had written. On the subject now, my my thing was never about cancer, but it, it it became interesting to me to find these things. For instance, let's talk about cancer in and of itself. And I'm getting to what we're talking about. You got to understand that this science is highly uh, convoluted and complex. 
uh, but it is highly centered and concentrated and focused on different populations for different reasons. And there is a definite uh, purpose for the way we are targeted and how we're handled. And we need to understand how our minds, our brains, and our bodies are responding to it because we're not just dealing with mind control. We're also dealing with health issues that are a subsequent result of that. So I want to kind of just touch on this. Like I said, this is the stuff we're talking about where we talk about beyond the surface. So we could talk about media and propaganda control and mind games and all that. We could talk about it on an anecdotal level and we could talk about it superficially and we could talk about it and still get our point across. Hey, man, we need to be careful what we watch and what we believe, what we trust us in the media, whether it's written media, whether it's uh, music, whether it's uh, news, whether it's movies, whether it's television, we need to be aware. But at the same time, it helps to understand the dynamic. And I also want to kind of represent the level of intensity in which I've engaged this so that to so to gather an understanding so that the programs I create are effective. To me, this isn't about a pat on the back. To me, what I do isn't about likes and shares. What I do isn't about being liked. What I do is about being as effective as I possibly can, can in my area of expertise and in my, in, in my specific uh, gifting and function to do something that leaves a legacy that helps my people come out of this 400 year hiatus in which we have allowed the world to mishandle us and we have to understand that there's no accident in the developing of a docile mind and that there is literally negative health consequences that also come with it so what i learned is that say for instance cancer since since i, I mentioned that you know we're all born with uh, disease genes. What epi epigenetics does on one side, like I said, it it it, it it's all about a representation of the passing down of a, of a genetic tag. That's a representation of a traumatic experience that happened in the past with the pro progenitor, the parent or grandparent, and now it's passed down to the offspring, and the offspring is impacted by the traumatic experience, even though they never experienced it. That's one way that multi-generational transmission of trauma takes place, and that we are consistently experiencing it because we have not healed from it, and I'm going to get to that in, in subsequent weeks. But what also happens with epigenetics is the environmental influences of our thinking and perceptions of what we're dealing with in going through adverse childhood experiences aces we are experiencing more trauma a lot of the trauma is perpetuated by our parents who were also traumatized and are not only passing down the trauma genetically but also through social learning theory and experientially by traumatizing us because they were traumatized in other words my mama beat my butt so i'm gonna beat your butt ain't nothing you know nothing wrong with me i did fine no you're sitting up advocating hurting a child whooping a child because they wouldn't do what you want to what do you think you got that from what do you actually think that originally came from and how do you think it's going to be a positive uh measure when your child is afraid of you your child fears you your child is doing the right thing for the wrong reasons and you don't think that's carry on but here's the here's the big thing what happens in these negative experiences is that the child, as they grow into life and grow into adulthood, also take those experiences and it impacts their gene expression. In other words, you, can, you have the ability, that's what epigenetics is, the ability to turn on genes, turn off genes, upregulate genes, downregulate genes, change gene expression without changing gene sequence or DNA sequence. So what does that mean? That means like in order for you to have one form of cancer you have to have a certain amount of cancer genes turned on and actively expressing themselves simultaneously that's not something that easily happens but here's the thing the more negative environment you're in the more negative thinking you're in the more stress you're in the more worry you're in the more troubles you have to deal with the more t times your fight or flight response system through your uh, autonomic uh, nervous system is triggered and you have this stress, fear, release of adrenaline and cortisol, 
the more negatively your body responds to it, the more disease genes are upregulated and you are now more likely to develop cancer. It's also the same with diabetes, the same with heart disease, same with liver disease, thyroid disease, and a number of other different ailments. It's not simply dietary, even though dietary and nutrition plays a major role. It's also mental. It's also experiential. It's also environmental. And when I say environmental, I'm not talking about the carcinogens in the air. I'm not talking about whether you're drinking out of plastic water bottles. I'm talking about how stressful is your home life? How stressful is your job? How stressful is your financial situation? How stressful is your marriage? All of these things play a major role in gene expression. Are we upregulating disease genes or are we downregulate? Are we upregulating health genes, the production of different health hormones? There's this thing, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but I want to kind of talk about it. the power of the mind. It is so huge in this, and this is something that they understand. Here's here, here's something else. We're talking about uh, the power of the mind uh, to literally control and create a reality. Remember, your personality is what creates your reality, and that if you're going to literally change your personality, you've got to understand how to do that from the science of neuroplasticity. In other words, what am I engaging, right? But here's the thing. When you are sitting up and you are literally allowing someone else to dictate what your gates are taking in, then you are subsequently allowing them to dictate your health, dictate your financial outcomes, dictate your ability to impact the world around you and to be a presence in this world, which is a part of your responsibility. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has something for which they are uh, required to make their impression upon this world. The problem is so many of us have been robbed of it because we've been told who we are from, from day one. We've been put in an environment that is literally sucking the life out of us mentally, emotionally, and psychologically. Here's the thing. What you have to do in the power of attention in, 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 in the form of neuroplasticity, with, which ultimately impacts epigenetics, is to learn how to experience the emotion ahead of the experience or to feel the emotion ahead of the experience. People, back when I was going through the roughest time of my life, they would tell me I was in denial. They would tell me, man, how are you sitting up smiling? How are you working in homeless shelters and, and, and serving people when you're going through what you're going through? You're in denial. You, 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 you and, and you know, I mean, all kind of different things. They were accusing me. I said, no, what you don't understand is I'm operating in my circumstances because my circumstances are real and in present time I'm operating in my circumstances but I'm living in my future destiny in other words I've already seen it I've spoken it I've established within my mind my thought has cre my mind has created these thoughts and these ideas that create a level of peace that remove the apprehension the stress and the concern about the moment because I'm already aware that the moment is momentarily and here's the beautiful thing about it is that you can be present in the future or you can be present in the past you can be present now, but you can also be present in the future of the past. What does that mean? If I'm present in the past, then I'm a victim of the past. I will have a very predictable future based off of what my past experiences are. If I'm present in the past, that means I spend a lot of time thinking about what I've been through. I spend a lot of time thinking about all the things that have gone on, good or bad, depending on where your life is and how your past looks. But if you're a person who had a bad past, the last thing you want to do is be present in your past. Why? Because there's no future in it. However, when I'm present in the future, I can sit up now and create in my mind through my imagination given to me by God any desire anything I want to that's what's called um, for those who study the Bible whether you're Christian or not those who study the Bible that's what call is called calling things that are not as though they were it's the manifestation of an idea and reality here's the beauty of it the Creator made us to where our brains and minds cannot tell the difference of what's being imagined and what's actually happening so when I'm able to create an idea or an imagination of something something so real something so powerful that I can literally feel the emotions of it meaning that I've immersed myself 
uh, one way to do this is through priming at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day and meditating and creating a mental state in which you visit these places that you are creating and you take on the experience as if it's happening and your body will literally start to feel the emotion that you would normally feel if you were actually experiencing it and it's training itself to feel it and now it'll get to the point that when all you have to do is think about it and the emotion comes why is the emotion so important the emotion is a part of your real natural experience and how you feel has a major impact on how you perceive experiences emotions are absolutely necessary in order to create lasting experience what you'll find out is if you go to a, a seminar or even in church what you will find out is that's why in church for those of us that are black and grew up in southern baptist church of god and christ uh holding the churches where hooping as was a part of the sermon that's why so many people could remember what was said during the hoop versus what was doing doing uh, what what was said during most of the sermon why because the hoop heightened the emotions and when your emotions are heightened the uh, experiential impact on the neurons that are being created. I mean, we talked about neuroplasticity and the creation of new neurons, neuro, new, new neurosynaptic connections that are wired and connect. Well, the thing is, the more emotional the experience, the more powerful it's impressed upon the brain and the mind, and the more uh, clear and uh, concise the memory. Now, these memories, if consistently engaged over time, become beliefs. That means they dictate and control how we perceive things, what we expect of things, how we operate. And so again, what we take in consistently, especially, why do you think that some of the most negative things that we get are also designed to trigger us emotionally simultaneously? Why? Because even when we're looking at it and not liking it, it's becoming an imprint and an idea. And the brain doesn't operate on, well, this is wrong, or this is right. Uh, this is true or this is false it operates on we're engaging it so I tell people all the time don't focus on what you don't want because the brain will still give it primary uh, primary priority and you will literally be creating the things you don't want focus on the things you want create a mindset and a memory and an idea and emotional experiences based off of what you want it's so important but we've been fed consistently and this is scientific this can be measured energy can be measured frequency can be measured your thoughts and how it behaves what you've got to understand is that we're literally operating off of the realities that are being created through our thinking but most of us are not controlling our own thought processes most of us uh, there's even a verse in the Bible one of my favorite uh, passages uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 beginning at verse 3 it says that though we walk in the flesh we're not we do not war according to the flesh uh, for the weapons of warfare are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing what every thought into captivity bringing what every thought into captivity how much of your thinking are uh, is in your control how much of your thinking have you surrendered to other people how much of your thinking is something that is being pushed upon you through the mediums in which you engage how much time are you spending on your tablet out of uh, control of what you're taking in how much is playing on your radio that you don't control what's in the music that we're allowing our kids to listen to how are we managing these new neurosynaptic realities and connections that are being created in the brain daily, literally daily? What are we nurturing when we create these synaptic connections? It, it doesn't make any good to read something positive in a book and then after you read it, the next 10 days is spent with taking in nothing but negative information, negative music that d disrespects our women and degrades and, and devalues our men and, and, and puts us at the mercy of other people. Uh, what good does that one paragraph, one page, or even one book when all the rest of your time is spent taking in information that does not support what you're trying to do you need to nurture the ideas and the things you take into your mind 
it's it's so important that you do that. Um, and so, and then the next thing I want to talk to you about is the auto. Uh, auto, uh, autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the system that controls uh, all of the things such as bodily functions, heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, uh, urination, sexual arousal, uh, pupillary uh, response. That's when your pupils dilate when it gets dark. All that stuff is by the auto. And here's the biggest thing that the autonomic uh, nervous system controls. Fight or flight response, uh, which is a part of the um, mo most ancient part of the brain, sometimes also known as the reptilian brain. It is something that is triggered automatically through the autonomic nervous system, and it is a fear stress response. Fight or flight says there's something going on. The problem is most of us are literally dealing with emotions that create this fear inside of us based off of stimuli, past experiences, and so much more in which we are constantly triggering the fight or flight response, but there's no predator around the corner. The fight or flight response was during a time when life expectancy was sharp because there were so many predators and dangers out there that you literally walked out and there was a chance that there was something that waiting on you your the hairs on your uh, neck would stand up you would sit something was wrong your heart would start beating fast adrenaline and cortisol would be released in the blood and, and, and uh the blood that would normally for, flow to the prefrontal cortex of the uh, brain or the neocortex of the brain that that controls all of the thinking and and rational decisions and all that uh it will stop flowing to the brain that's 30 percent of blood flow will be redirected to your extremities your arms and your legs why so you can either square up and fight or you could run and then once you got out of danger you would sense there was no longer danger your heart rate would drop your respiratory rate would drop you would stop producing cortisol and adrenaline and you will start to redirect your blood flow back to way so you can think, okay, and you log it. I don't go that way anymore because that's danger that way. And you would then think rationally and reasonable. The problem is so many people make poor decisions because they are constantly in a fight or flight state. Why? You cannot make reasonable and rational decisions because the prefrontal cortex shuts down during fight or flight. If you're stressing out, that's not the time to make decisions. If you're fearful, that's not the time to make decisions. But what we have to understand is what are the things that are triggering us? I heard, I was talking to one of my clients this week and they were telling me that they actually had someone that they knew that literally once it was finally announced that Joe Biden was the president elect, they literally crashed in their bed and cried all night from the strain of the stress and the fear of what would happen with another four year of Trump's. Uh, I'm not gonna even get into why that shouldn't be a fear. Uh, but that's what we've been led to believe. Again, what we are taking in, what we allow to be pushed upon us as our reality and our truth is going to dictate how we think and how we feel about ourselves. The truth of the matter is everybody has the power to control their destiny. Now, in order to do that, you've got to have a change in the way you think, a change in the way you move. The more dependent you make yourself on someone else, the less control you have of your own movement. So in order to say I'm in control of my destiny, that means I cannot be dependent upon others. Now, while I may need the help of others, I will be dependent upon no one individually and exclusively because then they control my destiny. What I will do is I will find people with like minds. What I will do is find people who see the value in what I do. What I do is find people who can see the profitability in ensuring that I profit. And then I will work from there and I will build from there. I will operate from there. I will do the things that are necessary from there. But I must maintain my personal sovereignty. I must maintain the ability to control what comes into my thought. Back to that verse in second. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Look, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. I must control my thinking. I must be a manager of my thoughts. I must be cognitively aware. I must also be coherent in the way that my heart moves. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about some things. Um, priming and setting. Do you realize that elevating your state of mind for a minimum, I mean, for a a uh, minimum of 10 minutes per day for four days per week can literally improve the body's immune function by 50%. Do you realize that your thinking had that much control? That's why I was telling everybody, be careful what's happening with this pandemic. Why? Because 
the fear alone is negatively impacting your immune system. Things that were normally not, you would either not contract it or you would contract it and it wouldn't bother you is going to have a more impactful effect. We're running and dealing with the idea of what's going on with COVID and not realizing that in, in, in the fear in and of itself, there are a bunch of other things and practices that are in play that are not necessarily in our best interest. But let's just talk about the fear. The fear of what's going on, the fear and the apprehension and the stress is literally lowering our immune systems. So you have the fear of catching it, the fear of the financial fallout, the fear of what's going on in an election year and what is actually happening in the, co co uh, in the totality of the presence of all this fear. Epigenetic responses, genes are being upregulated that are non-healthy, that are disease genes that will cause us to age. See, we're talking about something here. What we find out is not only does meditating for as little as 10, 10 minutes a day, and for those of you, prayer can also be a form of meditation when you do it right. See, most people, uh, and I tell people all the time, one of, one, one of the uh, pastors I uh, counseled back in 2012, when I was going through everything I was going through, I was also counseling pastors, some of very large churches, and one called me one day and he was like, man, I'm done. I'm going to walk away from it all. If you can't give me a solid answer, I'm going to walk away from it. I can't do this anymore. And I said, okay, what's the question? He says, why is it that black people are the most church, the most spiritual, the most prayed up, the most committed, the most loyal, and yet we end up at the bottom all the time? Where is God in that? Tell me that. And I said, first and foremost, there are a couple of things. First of all, we don't understand the true dynamics of faith. We have bought into a bastardized version of what is and what faith is and how faith operates. Um, second of all, we have misled, misguided, and rehearsed prayer lives. Um, I said, tell me, 99% of the people who pray spend their entire time talking. When are they listening? See, a conversation is a two-way thing. It's a two-way experience. It's about being able to hear. And it's not necessarily that you're going to hear from God audibly. It means that you've got to be on such a spiritual wavelength, such a mental wavelength, such a high brave wavelength that you literally can hear the consciousness of God in what is happening. See, the consciousness of God isn't off somewhere in some far distant place called heaven. The consciousness of God is in everything around you. The consciousness of God is the purity of awareness. It's the pureness of consciousness that comes out of matter. Matter in and of itself can be transformed into consciousness. Energy becomes consciousness. So when I elevate my thinking, when I elevate my expectations, when I meditate, I raise my level of consciousness. So if I begin to pray and I start my prayer with gratitude, I always teach my kids, me and my wife, when we pray, whatever we do, it's always with gratitude first. Matter, matter of fact, most of it is focused on gratitude. Why? Because gratitude is an understanding and an, an idea and a notion and a representation that what I am thankful for is already happened. So I'm not just thankful about what I can see. I'm not all, and I'm not just thankful about what I've been through. I'm thankful about what's coming. And what that means is it sends a message to the brain that says, I'm thankful. And that gratitude acknowledges it at a level that the sub, that the conscious mind can't grab that the subconscious mi conscious mind is aware of that says it's already happened see the subconscious mind controls 96 percent of my behavior 96 percent of my thinking and my movement and my actions it controls my destiny that's what was known as the heart in the bible guard your hearts and minds see the mind is the conscious part that I'm, that that i'm always aware of that that i'm actually uh directly thinking about now but the subconscious are the things that control the subconscious is so powerful the subconscious is what is responsible for you driving home getting off into a conversation and some other things and thinking and looking up and you're pulling in your driveway and you don't remember the last 20 minutes and you're wondering man how did i get here your subconscious has driven that before your subconscious knows it your subconscious took over and let you do what you needed to do consciously and got you home safe the subconscious is what happens with all of the decisions that you make it's making it based off of experiences in the past and its ideas and the belief system that governs your movement. You have to be willing to change all of that if you're not happy with what you're having. Now, I know I'm covering a lot of things, but I'm going to go back over this and I'm going to be very specific in the coming weeks and touching all this. But again, priming is so important. Check out what else happens when you sit up and you meditate. There is research and data being taken now that shows that 
when you are positively setting your state, when you're meditating, when you're creating a new environment for your mental ideas and your thoughts and your processes at a time, that over a very short period of time, you can actually regrow your telomeres. What are telomeres? Telomeres are these long little things, technical things that are at the end of your helix on your DNA. It represents your youthfulness. What happens is every time there are cellular reproductions, your telomeres get shorter. This is why you age. Ultimately, your telomeres will no longer be there and you, you will pass away. What we're finding is through meditation, people are literally reclaiming years to their lives and extending and growing their telomeres. Also, there's other gene expression that is taking place that can be measured. Brainwave leaks measured. Here's something else you got to be able to understand that, um, that, 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 that's so important. And that is the mentality of how you think also creates this upgrade, this biological upgrade and the power of the mind. And I'm going to finally end this with the power of the mind and the impact of the human placebo. Uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza wrote a book called You Are the Placebo, The Power of the Mind. Now, the power of the mind is, is, is beyond measure. You can't measure it. There are no limitations. We create the limitations through our beliefs. You are only limited by what you believe. Your limiting beliefs control your limits. When you start to lift those uh, limitations, you start to lift your potential. And that's why I tell anybody, everybody has the ability to control their destiny, but they must deal with the limiting ideas and thoughts they have about life, about themselves, the belief that life is happening to them. That's one of the things that has been imparted upon the African American community as a whole is that life is happening to you, that you have no control over it, that you must ask someone else permission for you to come out of what's going on. You must ask someone else to be benevolent to you in order for you to experience anything other than what you've experienced because you lived in a, a situation in which you were dependent upon a race of people for so long for food for shelter for everything else that idea is now embedded and inculcated into your psyche and passed down even through genetic expectation. And so now you believe anything other than what you have has to come through the hand that has always fed you. You have never ever entertained the idea that you have the power within yourself to take the reins of your personal sovereignty and walk out and do things on your own. It's, it's nothing wrong with identifying the source of the problem. But the more you blame the source, instead of saying it's that way because I haven't changed it, the more power you give it. You've got to take the reins. You've got to say, okay, that's what they're doing. I'm going to stop them from doing that. I'm going to stop expecting them to fix this issue and understand that them fixing this issue is never going to be a benefit to me, a benefit to them, so I can't expect them to work against their own interests. What I have to do is work in the interests that best benefit me, and that will in most instances be diametrically opposed to what they are looking to do and I've got to be okay with that. But it's going to come from me controlling my thinking, controlling my thoughts, being aware of what I'm pulling in through my gates, being aware of how I think and approach life, being aware how I deal with the challenges of life and understanding how it impacts me psychologically and emotionally and physically. I have to understand that I'm literally in control of my health, that not only can I increase my telomeres, I can create the up I can increase the upregulation of healthy genes, release what's necessary. Here's this thing about the placebo. And then I'm gonna be done for today. And we'll we'll be back next week uh, to start going down. We're going to start with neuroplasticity next week. Then the following week is epigenetics. And then we're going to move on and we're going to build on this thing. But here's the thing. Here's the placebo effect. The placebo effect is this idea in science where they take uh, a group of people they, that have a specific illness and they give a certain group real medication and they give another part of the group... Um, a, a sugar pill, a placebo, uh, which they think is the real medication. And then another part of the group 
won't get anything. And what they found out is the group that had the placebo would often heal and have less symptoms just as the people who took the pill. And what they found out was that the mind is so powerful that it, when it believes it should be healing, it will literally mimic and create the chemicals that were in the drug the people thought they were taking and then produce the same symptoms as if they took it. In other words, the mind has the ability to heal if you believe it will. And so the only element, the, the pill became simply the symbol of the possibility of healing. It became an emblem of the possibility of healing. So you can find the emblem of what you are believing and wanting and desiring and you can create it. Again, back to, it, this was initially just going to be about propaganda. And then I thought, man, there's so many people out there that need to know what I do with my clients, the work that I do, you know. And my thing is, I don't just have black clients. The predominance of my work is done with non-black clients because they understand the importance of the work I do and they are willing uh, to make the investment in themselves to do it. And I have to feed my family. Um, but all my money comes back into my family or into the work I do, and I bring it back to the black community. I spend very little of my time and money now in uh, other communities, other economies. Uh, there are certain things I like. I'm big on um, uh, fragrances. I love cologne, man. I've got hundreds of bottles, literally, um, of stuff that I've accumulated over time. Uh, then I have my favorites, but I actually have started going to a black brother who does uh, fragrances uh, all and he's on point. He gets it exactly right and I go to him and that's where I spend my time and it's he makes it affordable too. So it's great, but I support black businesses in whatever way I can. Uh, but what I'm getting at is this. I wanted to bring you a totality of what human experience is. We have to start to see ourselves as equal before we'll ever be treated equal. We have to start to see ourselves as powerful before we'll ever be able to make our power and our presence felt. We have to be able to understand the dynamics at play and how they impact us. We must be able to understand our perception becomes our reality and that we have the ability to control how we perceive things. We have the ability to control then how our reality turns out. We have way more control than they want us to know. That's why we are being bombarded. That's why our children are being miseducated. That's why we are being fed so many different lies about ourselves because that keeps us at bay that keeps us docile, that keeps us dumb. It is time for us to raise the level of our thinking and it's time for us to start walking. That's why I created Black Man Lead uh, uh, Rite of Passage Program because I became aware in studying uh, the proclivity of black male violence, the proclivity of black male criminality and understanding how it works, how it's tied to the uh, school system, how it's tied to the perception of being disrespected, how it's uh, tied to the lack of proper racial socialization uh, and the walking into and ushering into proper black manhood and I, I created that. I worked with my wife to come up with ghettos forgotten, restoring ghettos forgotten daughters for the girls. I've worked with creating ideas and in, in, in systems to help with economic Economic repair. Uh, we've got to be aware of all of the things we're dealing with, not for the, for, for the purpose of complaining, not for the purpose of pointing the finger and the blame, but for the purpose of creating mechanisms that literally work, that bring us up and raise us to the next level. That's my challenge. That's why I work. That's why I'm always calling on you guys. I don't get the support uh, financially that I need to make this thing happen, but I've never quit. I've never given up, given up. I've never set it down. I've had many talks with friends and they're like, man, so what are you going to do? And I'm like, man, I think I'm done. And then my heart won't let me quit. I'm just not built that way. And so I figure out a way to get it done. We could really use your support. But what, what I want to do here is I want to empower you. Um, there are some of you that may want to come work with me at the Vision Edits Institute. I'm also going to do a paper on what I just shared with you that I'm going to post on the Visionetics Institute and I'll come back and put it on this on this video uh, when I do that 
but what I would like to do, if any of you want to work with me, come work with me. No, it's not free. Uh, and it will call, call for you to make an investment. But I have created new mechanisms that makes it affordable at different levels for what you want to do. If you're serious about it, look, I've got uh, clients that pay me upwards uh, beyond t uh, 10 grand a year uh, to work with them, to help them create change. Not one complaint. I get the job done. I'm exceptional at what I do. I don't play small for nobody. I put the work in. I've been going at this for 30 years. I've been evolving for 30 years to bring it to a point to where I'm touching lives that will touch lives. And that's what I'm about. If you want to make that move and you want to get serious about changing your life, it's there. I don't care who you are, where you started at, it's there. But what I'm going to encourage you to do, regardless of whether you work with me or not, you've got to change. You've got to become a catalyst, uh, a force. Uh, you got to be aware of what's happening. And that's what this series is going to be about. It's going to be about creating an awareness of how things are happening and how we can control what's happening. And on that note, I'm going to get off of here. Like I said, I live my life on full every day. Why? Because when I die, I want to die on eat. I don't want to leave anything left undone. I don't want to leave anything that I've got to regret because I didn't finish. I didn't start or I didn't do it because it was hard, because it was difficult, because I was afraid. I am doing everything I can to live up to my destiny. Sometimes I fall short. I'm human, but I don't let that get me. I don't judge myself by past mistakes or by failures. I judge myself by the persistency in my gate, the fact that I keep moving, the fact that I keep fighting. I'm challenging you to do the same. Show some love in whatever way you want to show it, whether that's a like, a click, a share, a comment, or a donation. But whatever you do, keep coming back here. It's normally going to be on Thursdays. Today it's going up on Friday, but I guarantee you, uh, it's going to bless you. It's going to empower you. It's going to give you a new way of looking at life. And it's going to give you hope that you have the capacity and the power to change your life for the better. And that we as a people can rise up and live out the true nature of our design. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable weekend. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here. Dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the odyssey project is doing in the inner cities uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all the love and support that you have given uh, and sent my way and my wife's way and the organization's way. Now I want to just take a brief moment to remind you that we still need your support. We still need your help. Go to the description box of one of our videos and see how you can support the work we're doing. Keep supporting, keep loving us, and we're going to keep loving you back. Have an awesome day. Jay, people talk Real about talk, it. I ain't throwing shots. All of the elements.